Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Close your eyes and pull like that. <laughs> And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Oh, Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All Ireland champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. It's a Skibbereen Rowing Club special on the podcast today to mark 50 years of the famous club's existence. For many people... Around the country, the town of Skibbereen is synonymous with rowing. And on today's show, we're going to explore why that is. Today's podcast is brought to you in association with Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. For more, visit accesscu.ie. Two brilliant interviews today as we attempt to chart just why Skibbereen Rowing Club has delivered so many successes over the past 50 years. Up first, we'll chat to Olympic silver medalist Gary O'Donovan, and then we have an in depth interview with 2004 Olympian Eugene Coakley. And Kieran, we won't delay for too long, but it would be remiss of me not to ask about your own connection with the club. To use the old cliche, you literally wrote the book on Skibbereen Rowing Club, and that book is called Something in the Water. And so, after doing the research and interviewing the who's who, of club members are you any closer to discovering what exactly is in the water around Skibbereen and the banks of the island river that's worth noting too jack that something in the water is still for sale online and in, in all good bookshops so i'm just i'm just going to get that plug in straight away and um, you know like that uh, writing that book was one of the was one of the best things i've ever done in my career and um, probably the highlight so far because what it meant is i got to tell the story of this incredible club in Skibbereen that's packed with incredible people and characters and tell their, their story and share it with the rest of the the rest of the world and they deserve that for what they've done and um, like you said Jack it's Skibbereen World Club is going 50 years well 2020 was their 50th anniversary they were, they were founded in 1970 but because of 2020 being what it is the club couldn't mark that landmark event and um, the way they would have wanted to so in this week's Southern Star we have a four-page special on Skibbereen World Club and we also have this special podcast. So what is in the water in Skibbereen? Um, I think it's the people in the club are just unique. They're such special people. They they love the sport. They're so dedicated. They're so committed. They've give, given their lives to the sport. Um, and taking back to the, to the founding members, um, you have Richard Hosford, Danny Murphy, and Donny Fitzgerald. And the likes of Richard Hosford has been, his fingerprints are all over the club from day one. Back from that summer 1970 right to now, kind of his fingerprints are all over that club. Um, I'm thinking of Nuala Lupton, who was the, the first international oars person from the club. That was back in 1975 when she went to the Senior Worlds. And the year after, Nuala won the first ever Irish Senior Championship for Skibbereen with the Commercial Four in 1976. And you think that was 1976 and fast forward to now. And Skibbereen Rowing Club is the most successful rowing club in the country. 183 national titles, it's one jack, which is incredible. It's way out in front to top the charts. As well as that, Skibbereen Rowing Club is a home to five Olympians, to Ireland's first ever Olympic rowing medalist in Gary and Paula Donovan from, from 2016. There's world champions, European champions, Irish title winners. Uh, it's been an absolutely incredible journey this club has been on. And it's all thanks to the, to, to the hard work of the people involved in the club, from the brilliant coaches there to the brilliant training plan that they have, um, to the, to the young people from the Skibbereen Parish and beyond who have come into this club and what the club do then, they take that raw potential, they give them the tools, they give them the belief, they show them this training programme that is successful and they put them on the water 
they teach them how to race, they teach them how to win, and the rest is history. Like it's been a an incredible journey for the last 50, 51 years. And the good news is that Skibbering Roan Club is not finishing up anytime soon. Like there's a strong conveyor belt to talent there. This for rowing, um, both at Skibbering level and national and international level. And you can trace a lot of that back to Skibbering Rowing Club. Um, 2016, like I said, Gary and Paul won that Olympic silver medal and that broke the glass ceiling. That was the first ever Olympic rowing medal for Ireland. And since then, you can see the international team is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's athletes from right across the country. The pool of talent in Irish rowing right now was quite phenomenal. Already we have three or four boats qualified. I think it's four boats already qualified for the Tokyo Olympics. Two more boats are trying to qualify. So potentially six Irish rowing boats could be at the Tokyo Olympics, which again for Rome Ireland is an incredible haul. And that's across men's and women's rowing from heavyweight to lightweight. So the sport is getting stronger in Ireland. The sport rowing is very strong in Skibbereen. And like you said, it's put the town on the map. One of my greatest ever days with the Southern Star, well, two of them actually were the day that Gary Paul, that Friday when they won the Olympic silver, and also the homecoming in Skibbereen that Monday night. That was absolutely incredible. I've never seen the town like that before. It's one of those where were you moments. Um, I was lucky enough to be on the open top bus as I paraded up, up through Skibbereen um, before it landed in the town centre and to see the fanatical support kind of, and they were all there because of two rowers from this one special rowing club in this one pocket of West Cork that has just achieved phenomenal things and it's conquered the world. And before I finish up, before we uh, listen to some smashed interviews here, just a couple of weeks ago, I got a, a lady from New Brunswick in Canada touched base with me. Um, she was after reading the book, Something in the Water, and she was just blown away by Skibbereen Rowan Club and the characters ever involved. She heard of the club first back in 2016 after the Olympics, after Gary and Paul's silver medal. And she wanted to learn more about this special club in Ireland, in West Cork, that was doing extraordinary and phenomenal things. And she isn't it... In- book, she- Sorry, Kieran. Um, isn't it interesting, though, just to... To double down on what you're saying about that lady from from Canada, you know, hundreds, thousands, even miles away. Like anywhere you go in the world, if you're from Kerry, people will immediately say football. If you're from Kilkenny, will say people will immediately relate where you're from to hurling. But if you say you're from Skibreen, like I've been living in the town for the bones of three years now. And whenever I mention where I'm living to friends, family, new acquaintances, the first thing they mention is rowing and like for a town to to be so synonymous with sport it's quite something and such a, a, a niche sport on the grand scale but in Skibbereen it's anything but it's incredible like rowing has put Skibbereen on the world map like and if that's not being sensationalist that, that is the truth I think back to Kenneth McCarthy who's um who's one of the most successful rowers with the club a couple of years back just after 2016 he took his kids to see Santa it was up, up in North Cork and said, uh, when he heard him from Skibbereen, he goes, oh, you're from the town where the rowers are. Gary and Paul have been quite good this year. So just supposed to show that uh, that obviously the whole world knows about, about Skibbereen Rowing Club. The whole world knows about Gary and Paul. And it's probably important to mention too, and you'll hear it in my interview with Eugene, that the Rowing Club did not start in 2016. Skibbereen Rowing Club has been going strong since 1970. So think of Eugene Coakley, who went to two Olympics. Think of his brother, Richard Coakley, who went to the 2008 Olympics. I'm thinking of Timmy Harnady, who went to the 2004 Olympics, all skilled rowers. Denise Walsh went to the 2010 Youth Olympics in Singapore. Like I mentioned, Nuala Lupton. And we've got this far jack, but we even mentioned Dominic Casey's name, who was the World Rowing Coach of the Year in 2018. And uh, a man, again, whose fingerprints and handprints are, are all over this story, all over this club. Um, I always think of his house in Ardrella. It's perched up high. And it is a watchtower. He can see every boat moving up and down that river. Um, he's uh, been a phenomenal coach with the club and influence um, with the club. And the fact that you have the world's best rowers coming from Skibbereen Rowing Club, the world's best coach from Skibbereen Rowing Club, the most successful co- rowing club in the country is from Skibbereen. It just shows what this, like I said, this small country rowing club has done for the sport, for the town, for the region. It's, it's exceptional and it's brilliant technology them. Because, like I said, 50 years on the go is, is some record to have. And um, the conveyor belt is strong. 
Look ahead to this year's Olympics. We will have some skippery rowers there. We don't know their identities just yet. We will have Dominic Casey there. So um, there's a lot more chapters to be written in this story, Jack. Well, let's not delay any further than Kieran because we've got two brilliant interviews lined up with two of the names you've mentioned there. In a while, we're going to hear from Eugene Coakley, but up first, it's Olympic silver medalist Gary O'Donovan. Delighted to have Gary O'Donovan on this week's podcast. And Gary, it actually ties in perfectly with a big special that we're running in this week's Southern Star. It's four pages on Skibbereen Rowing Club, which celebrated its, kind of, its 50th birthday, you could say, last year. But obviously, last year was a, was a write-off in that sense. So we're running four pages on the Rowing Club in this week's Star. And taking pride of place, I'm doing a deep dive into Affidown, the parish of rowers. I'm trying to figure out, Gary, and you're the best person to ask, I think, why this one parish outside Skibbereen has produced Olympic medalists, world champions, European champions, um, multiple Irish championship winners over the years. Let's go back, let's go back to Dominic Casey, who was a rower before he even coached. Um, your dad, Teddy, was a, was a rower. With Timmy Harnady, an Olympian. There's yourself and Paul now. There's Finton and Jake. There's Emily Hegarty. There's Aoife Casey. There's so many. Why is Affidown such a rich place for rowers? That's a good question, Karen. I don't know. Um, I suppose it's just a pure chance, is it? <laughs> um, why is it such a good place? I don't know. I suppose, I guess a lot of it was probably just, I, I don't know, maybe there was a bit of history involved there, like back the old, um, the old way of doing things back in around the famine times where there was a lot of fishing, the fishing industry, like, and they used to, they used to do a lot of, um, a lot of working by boat there. I, I'm pretty sure, like, what they used to do is uh, fish out around the bay there, Roaring Water Bay and around the islands and, and what all the, the fishermen used to have to do then, I think, was they'd row their boats from, from West Cork up along the coast into Cork Harbour to sell, their, um, to sell their fish to make a living and then they'd row them back home. Um, there's actually a very good book there, Wholesale Yalls by uh, Cormac Leavis. I read that recently and he kind of documented all the history of the, the old fishing boats and, and the the hardship and the, the way of the world back in those days and there was an awful lot of rowing involved in it and I often think back to that like when I when I read it it kind of reminded me like geez it was tough and there's a big history and a heritage of of rowing before a rowing club was ever even invented in the, in the town like so um you know there could be a, there could be a bit of tradition there that, that helps um more recently then I suppose you know we've been lucky that 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 the club kind of got set up as you say 50 years ago like if if that never happened, sure there'd be no rowing and there'd be no there'd be no world champion medals or any kind of that, that kind of stuff. Um, so that was a bit of luck. Uh, we had some good guys and before us there from the parish like Timmy Harnady, but then a lot of it was you know there was guys who weren't from the guys and girls who weren't from the parish of Affidown too that would have had a, had a, have had a lot to do with the success of uh, the athletes from our parish. You know, like Eugene Coakley there, Skibreen men, but. He would have been an inspiration to all of us and, and a role model growing up in the rowing club. Uh, and he was successful internationally as well in his time. So that probably helped that we were able to, to look up to him. And then, you know, there's a lot of us at the minute. And being from Affidown, I, I don't know if that has much to do with it, but I think more so it got to do with us being members of the rowing club because, you know, it's got a, a good program there, a good history of success and, and, a, and a, a good coach that, that, kind of can help us get to international level and international success so uh, I don't think there's any straightforward answer to the question Kieran. like there's a lot going on but yeah um, it's, uh, it's, it certainly looks impressive on paper like You kind of mentioned there that, that, that tradition Gary and I was talking to Teddy before your dad and he was telling me that his grandfather and his granduncle were lobster fishermen and, That's right. and, and when he was young he had just kind of he felt that he had this connection with the water it was in his DNA and if you look at Dominic Casey's father had the sand boat up and down the river and um, carrying mm. cargo and so on. So when you were young, did, were you very aware of that connection to the water and how important the water was? Because if you look out your, your window, from your kitchen window, I think you can see Roaring Water Bay. Like you're, you're that close to the sea and that close to the, to, to that close to the water. So do you yeah. always feel in you, Gary, that you've had a connection with the water? I think so, yeah, yeah. For me personally, yeah, I, like, I really like the water. Um, I really like being on the water, you know, when we were young, like, like we used to work, uh, we used to work on, on the farm at home with dad when we were kids and sure the farm is right on the water, you know, his, 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 uh, his farm extended right down to the beach. So, um, we spend a bit of time around there. 
you know, mam used to have us, like in the summertime, we pretty much lived on the strand down in Kilkeleen. Mother used to pack up the picnic basket and we'd head down there in the morning and we wouldn't leave until dark, you know. Um, you know, we were swimming, I'd say we were swimming before we could walk the, way, the amount of time we spent down there. Then, you know, I suppose when we got older, we used to, we used to just kind of, sure that was the place to go and hang out. Like we used to, when we got our bicycles first, we used to all, all, all our friends and stuff, we'd, we'd ring around on the landlines on the house and we'd say, we'll meet down the strand and we'd just go skimming stones and this type of thing. And we used to be building rafts and dragging the rafts down the road to the strand and we'd jump in the water off of them and there just all kinds of this kind of stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, a big connection to it. And I suppose we were lucky when we were young, like myself and Paul, dad always had us in the rowing club. So before we ever went rowing, we were always around the river and around the boats and we used to love that. Um, um, and we used to be going to the regattas, like, and yeah, I think, I think, you know, when you're exposed to it when you're young, it probably helps. Like, I've, I, I do, I've, I've a, a love for the water, and it was funny there. Like myself and Paul went to, um, we went on a holiday a few years ago to Norway, and we were sitting in the the hotel the first morning. We we're like, right, what will we do? And we said, sure, we'll head as far as the water anyway, because we we're in Oslo and it's it's built in the water. Like, and we says we go down to the water and we'll see what's going on down there. And sure, we found ourselves straight away in like this kind of a, a history museum about Viking ships and. Uh, taking photos of all the old ships and the, the history of them and sending them on to dad because he's, he has a big interest in that type of thing. You know, he's a shipwright himself. He works in the boat yard. So, um, yeah, this, like, we just seem to have an interest for the water, I suppose. Yeah, long story short. Like I said, if I don't like that's kind of the, the premise of one of my main pieces, just why this one parish has produced so, so many, so many rowers. And just say that if I don't for a second, and I think that this can be replicated throughout every parish in the country, but... Obviously, it's your home parish, and it's been so good to you over the years. I'm thinking of the, the bonfires at Kilkenny and Cross after those great occasions. They were family, friends, and neighbours come together. The local priest organising a fundraiser for years ago. They had to raise money. Um, I think it was yourself, Paul, and Shane, was it to go to a world junior? It's kind of the parish and the people of Affadown have really supported you every step of this way. And even, Gary, I think back to the night after the homecoming in Skibbereen in 2016, there was a homecoming in Affadown. And that, to me, is always stuck in my mind. That was that was just a special night. Again, you with family, friends and neighbours. So as much as you've given to the parish, they've supported you every step of the way as well. Yeah, yeah. In fairness, Jesus has a fierce sense of community down there. And it, it isn't just for us in the rowing. Like, I mean, no matter who does well and no matter what they do, like, there's always a, a fierce sense of pride. Like, I remember there used to be there used to be the bonfires out there when, when Island Rovers were successful in years gone by, you know, and we used to always look forward to them and there was fierce excitement when the lads would be coming home on the open top bus and um, beeping the horns and this type of stuff. And even, you know, like I, I just remembering how, how proud everyone was as well last year when uh, when Holly Cairns got elected to to the doll. Like that was that was massive and you know that had never been done from anyone in our in our area like before. So we were all very, very proud of that. Um, the rowing, you know, like, like you mentioned there, like the recent bonfires, but sure, those bonfires were going on for years before we ever won anything. You know, we'd be coming home from regattas um, internationally and we'd have our heads held in shame because we were pretty much coming in last place and, and they'd be all out with the, with the fires lit and the flags waving and the sing song going. And Father Cahill would be bringing the big, um, he used to bring the, the microphone and the big speaker, you know, the one that he'd have for, for when he'd be saying the funerals out in the graveyard, like, and he'd bring, bring that down to the bonfire so we could sing a song through it. And, you know, there was always that that kind of excitement and that kind of pride and just just the fact that we were doing it you know and doing something different I think people were proud of that and sure like you know you'd tip on from the bonfire then up to in hands and Joss would be there and sure there'd be points going and you know it's just all, all a bit of crack and I think that that kind of brings people together as well and it gives people something to to smile about and to be happy about and sure like you know if something someone's doing something and it gets people excited then that's a good thing too and you know people are always very they're, they're very proud like of, of um of their own people like and that's that's great like i think that's a kind of a good thing about ireland in general like all irish people tend to be very proud of their own and and um we're, we've been very lucky to be uh beneficiaries of that in in uh in affadown at home as well like yeah i think the parish of affadown skibbereen the road club not west cork is pretty excited at the moment because to break it down for our listeners we have four affadown men battling for two seats in an olympic bound boat and they're trained by an affadown men as well so You've Gary and Paul O'Donovan, you've Jacob Finton McCarthy and Dominic Casey then is Coach Casey, he's he's the coach. So five F men are involved in this sport. So just to check in out, what's the latest? How are things going in, in preparation for, for the Olympics later in the year? I know there's trials on ongoing at the moment. So what's what's the latest, Gary? Um the latest yeah, things are going good. Like, you know, um the 
the the training's going well. Like um, it's a bit different this year because we haven't been we haven't been out foreign at all. You know, usually over the winter time we'd be heading to the south of Spain. We'd pack up a boat trailer, load of boats, and we'd send them down to Seville uh, to get in some warm weather and stuff. So it's been a it's been very different, and we're doing a lot more training on land because you know when we're in Spain we can get on the water every day because the weather is a bit better. So we're doing more training on land, which uh, you know it's it's, it's different. It's um, but it's good because we've got more uh you get more uh data from the rowing machines than you would on the water um you get more like um numerical and quantitative feedback so we can tell like that we're all very good and very fit and we've done some testing there the last couple of weeks and and we're all very fit like as, as fit as we've ever been and you know we, some of us have been setting pvs in, in some of the tests and and uh yeah so you know it, it's going well like we can't complain really and the weather, is, the weather will hopefully be picking up for the spring now, so we'll be able to get in some good water work for the next couple of weeks and months. We told you before, Gary, that the battle to get in the Irish, the Irish men's lightweight double is almost tougher than some international regattas because you've such world class athletes all battling for those to, those two seats. Like it's an incredible pool of talent that there is there. To yeah, win. it's very good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you could like that's pr- pretty much growing across the board in all events as well. Like I mean. For a long time there, the, the main boat was the, the men's lightweight double with myself and Paul and trying to people, you know, Finton and Co and Shane, all these lads are all trying to get into that boat. And now, now you see it across um, more boats like the heavyweight men's double, which is a very good boat. There's there's very good competition to get into that. The same with the, the women's sweep team, you know, they've got a boat qualified and Emily's hoping to, to get into that boat or the four. Uh, which is, you know, it's very competitive. Like the we were lucky before to, if we had... Um, two or three girls competing at a, at a world championships back, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, for a long time, Sunita was the only woman. And now there's, there's, a, there's about 10 or 15 women trying to get onto the team, like, um, and they're all doing very well and they're all winning medals, you know, like Emily, Emily's been winning medals there during the summer at the under 23 European championships. You've got Lydia uh, and Aoife there, so they were winning medals at the under 23 European championships and they're all competing at the senior championships as well. So, so like it's tis, tis growing across the board and it's getting more competitive for everyone and uh, and you can see that that that's paying dividends in the results of the, the Irish rowing team internationally as well and and I think it's uh you know it's good for Skibbereen Rowing Club that we've been able to have a, a big part of that that success in Irish rowing in recent years. Like we know that there will be two Skibbereen Rowing Club men in that Irish lightweight double going to Tokyo later in the summer. At the moment we don't know what two Skibbereen Rowing Club men are going to be in the boat. For you, Gary, the motivation, or it might be the wrong word, but is to get your seat back in the boat. Finton was with Paul when they won World Gold in 2019. And you gave me a brilliant quote when we chatted last year. You said, you can do two things. You can just sit there and not be in the boat, or you can drive on, train hard, and try and get, and get back in the boat. Obviously, you're in the latter camp. You're, you're driving on to get back in the boat. Um, is that a big motivation for you, just to... Just to get back into that Irish lightweight double. Uh, sure, that is that is the motivation, like you know, to to be in the boat to go to the Olympics, like yeah, that's to, to, there is no other motivation, like um, yeah, it it is like sure, we're just training hard, and it's a kind of a thing where like I sure like whether I do or don't make the boat, I don't know whether I will or won't, like I'll try my best, and it's just kind of the same, you know, going to Rio, like you 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 try and win a gold medal at the Olympics, and we tried it and we didn't win, but. You know, we got a silver medal, which was good, um, and we were very happy with that. Like, and I guess it's a kind of a case like I'm I'm doing my best every day, and and I'll try and make the boat. And if I do, then that'll be great. And if I don't, sure, like, show sure, out about it. Like, I mean, I've once I've tried my best, and someone beats me, then fair play to to whoever it is. Uh, but hopefully, I will make it. Like, you know, that's kind of I, I'd be I'd be happier with that than to not make it. But once I try my best, and there's no more I can do than that. Like. But I think back to after 2016, and obviously the, the country went wild when yourself and Paul won that, that silver medal in Rio. It was the first time Ireland ever medaled at, in a rowing event at an Olympics. But it always struck me, even Paul said it afterwards, that, that gold is obviously like you want to win gold. So do you have unfinished business with the Olympics in that sense? Because yourself and, and Paul, you want to bring home the gold. You want to go one step further than you did in, in, in 2016. Um, well, I wouldn't call it unfinished business. Like, I mean, it's it is just the way it is. Like, I mean, I'm able to do it, and I'm happy to do it. And I want to be doing this and, and trying to win. Um, uh, so, so like, yeah, like I mean, that's been the goal forever. Like, it's to try and win the Olympics. It's uh, that's that's as good as it gets, really. So, as long as we can keep trying to do that, I'd say we we probably will keep trying to do that. You know. 
and we're talking today, Gary, because FPD had their Make a Difference program and it's supporting um, Team Ireland Olympic hopefuls and they're packed to get to Tokyo. Um, as someone who's been to the Olympics before, you know what it's all about, you know how hard it is to get there. So what FPD are doing, it's brilliant to support these young athletes and, and that includes some of the rowers from Skibbereen, like Aoife Casey, mm-hmm. I think is, um, and Nidia Hefe, as well as Phil Healy. So it's great to see these local athletes get a helping hand on, on their journey. That's it, like, yeah, Karen, in fairness, you, you, you hit the nail on the head with that. It's brilliant, like, to fair play to FBD. Like, I mean, it, it's not an easy thing to do to, to support an athlete that, that isn't there, you know? I mean, you can, you can it, it, it's not because it's a, it's a chance and you're taking a gamble and, and they might not get a return on it, like, and, but I don't think that's what it's about for FBD. They, they want to help, like, and they're, they want to help people and give them a chance. And it kind of shows that they're, that, 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 that they're good people that work for that company and good people that, that are willing to take a chance on someone. And, and you know, it's often a conundrum for, um, for athletes is that, like, they need access to resources to be successful. And often you don't get access to resources until you are successful. And I think, you know, for, for FB to, to show that, okay, look, you, you haven't made it yet, but we're willing to take a chance on you and give you, give you, some, give you access to these, these very valuable resources that you need. Um, that should pay dividends. I know, like I would have taken someone's arm and leg off to for that chance before um, before I got successful. And and if it makes their lives a little bit easier uh, outside of their sport, which I'm sure it will, then that will surely benefit them in their sport. And hopefully, then we'll we'll see the results of that um, of that investment come the Olympic Games and uh, and long into the future. You know, if, if athletes are just given that chance, it, it it'll. I'm sure they'll all appreciate it, and and they they won't let it go to waste, and and they'll prove that. Uh, that FBD are um, doing the right thing in, in giving them that support and, and hopefully we'll see the results in the Olympics, you know. That's off the FBD and this one. It's a great initiative, like you said there, Gary, and it's helping support local athletes and athletes right across the country. So it's a, it's a great programme. Come here, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and best look in the weeks and months ahead and we'll all be supporting you all the way. Great. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me on. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Now, Kieran, we've just heard from Gary O'Donovan, who, along with his brother Paul, in many ways put Skibreen Rowing Club on the mainstream map, but he was by no means the first star to come from Skibbereen Rowan Club. No, 100%. And you heard Gary there mention the name of Eugene Coakley. And when Gary and Paul O'Donovan were young, they were chasing the likes of Eugene Coakley and Richard Coakley, Timmy Harnady, down the Island River. Eugene, like I said earlier, was the first Olympian from the club. He went to the Sydney Olympics. He went to the Athens Olympics, got to the A final in Athens. Um, he won World Silver. He won World Cups. He was one of the the first real big international stars from Skibbereen Rowing Club. So I was delighted to catch up with him a little bit earlier to tell his story. Some of our listeners might not be aware, but before Gary and Paul, there was a Skibbereen Rowing Club. Some people seem to think the Rowing Club started in 2016 when Gary and Paul won that silver medal at Rio, but the club was going a long time before that, from 1970. And we're delighted to be joined now on the podcast by the club's first ever Olympian, Eugene Coakley. Welcome to the podcast, Eugene. Thanks very much, Kieran. Delighted to be here. Um, let's go back to the start of your story. You started in the Rowing Club, I think you were 14 or 15. You were a student in St. Faulkner's inside in Skibbereen. What pulled you into the Rowing Club? How did you end up in the Rowing Club in the first place? Well, funny, um, last week I just heard your interview with Tony Davis, my neighbour from Skibbereen. And I guess that was my dream, starting out to be a footballer. Like the Davis is kind of, and the Skibbereen footballers set the way there back in, was it early 90s? And I gave football a go and I was pretty much useless at it. And I knew the game was up when I was given to the opposite team, Cora, a couple of years um, when I was about 14. They were short one player. So the Skibbereen coach gave me Cora and <laughs> I knew the game was up. So I, I simply decided then I'd go out to the rowing club with a couple of mates and give rowing a go. And that was when I was a 14 year old just finding my way in, in, in life with sports. And I suppose I was lucky enough to meet um, Dominic Casey a couple of years later and the rest is history then, I guess. 
Oh, Donovan Ross's loss, so was Skibber in Rome Club's gain. And you kind of mentioned there meet, meeting Dominic Casey, and he's obviously he's such an important part of your of your rowing story from, from start right through to, to the to the finish. Um let's go back to those early years so with the with the rowing club. Um first time out in the water, did you like it? Did you did you did you see yourself, oh I'll come back again and again and again? I don't know, I didn't really. I never, you know, when I started, it was just a couple of lads, 14, 15 years old, were having fun, and I, I never had any dreams of going any further with it and I found it quite it's it's quite a difficult sport in the end you know to take up you, you know you have to have some level of skill and be at it a while like surfing you can't just pick up a surfboard and expect to be good at it and enjoy it so I mean it, it just developed naturally we were kicking around um jumping in different boats and just having fun really um and it wasn't the first couple of years I was kind of being coached by a lady called Mary Bohan and um, Dennis McCarthy, um, God rest him. But it was only because Dominic was still competing at a high level at this stage. And I guess when he retired in the late 80s, early 90s, he then brought me into Cox, um, a women's crew that he'd been coaching. And it just developed from there, then I guess. You were in a very kind of successful skull, didn't with James Lupton? He was a, he was a top rower at the time. James was, and you know, his mother knew, I suppose, showed him. How to do it? Um, Nula was the, the first Irish champion or for Skibreen Rowing Club um, back in 1976 when she rode with UCD. And yeah, James and myself were probably the only two left out of the group, the initial group that had joined maybe two years earlier. And I remember talking to Dominic and I was going to give up when my four had disbanded um, for one reason or another. And Dominic said, why don't I go on the single skull? And I said to him, but sure, I don't know how to go in the single skull. So he put me out in the skull and then he paired me up with James. And I suppose we had a, a very good partnership then, you know, from junior 16, we did the home internationals and then up to 17 and 18. Uh, so myself and James did have a good partnership as, at a junior level. And then we, we brought in a couple of more young guys then. You you might have mentioned uh, in articles previously about John Welly coming on board and Paul O'Sullivan. Um John Welly was an interesting story. He came in via a very original talent ID system that Dominic had, you know, go into the school and get the biggest guy who's available and bring him out to the club. And that's exactly how it happened. And you mentioned there like John Welly, Paul O'Sullivan, and you were part of that, that Skibbereen Junior Men's A crew that won the club's first ever national championship title in that boat in 1997. I was looking, um, you were there, your um, younger brother Richard was the Cox, Kevin O'Donovan, uh, Paul O'Sullivan, John Whaley, Kieran Hayes, Kenneth McCarthy, Michael O'Brien, James Barry. When you look back at, at that win, that was quite a significant win for, for the club back in 97 because you had a very strong kind of pool of, of your men at the time. It's funny you said 97. It's, it seems like you know, the other day, but it's, it's 24 years ago. Um, but I, I can cl- clearly remember it was a, a watershed moment for the club because we had never won the Junior 8 Championship. OK, we had won a couple of championships in the smaller boats like the doubles and the skulls and stuff like that. But to win the Junior 8 kind of, it, to be the best Junior 8 in Ireland, you know, you have to have a depth of a squad. And it was the first time that Skibreen then was able to say, well, look, we are one of the, the forces in Junior Roya at this time. And it was the starting point, I'd say, from the success that we've had ever since that Junior 8, that squad, you know, that we had. There were some great names in there that you mentioned. When did you become aware, didn't you, Gene, that, OK, I'm actually quite good at this. I can actually go quite far because, obviously, you've the, the kind of international recognition. You were kind of coming up along the ladder there. And was there any one moment for you kind of knew, Jesus, I can I can really go far here? Um, I kind of, back when I was 17, we did the, the Coupe de la Genèse. It's like the European Championships. And we did well there, myself and James. We got a, a silver and a bronze. But I, I never thought about, you know... The Olympics or World Championships at senior level was well off the radar at this stage. And we did the Junior Worlds in 1997 and came sixth. Um, and I thought, you know, it's a fantastic achievement. But I, I still wasn't, I don't know, was this naivety about how far I could go in the sport or what? But I never did think that I can go on to the Olympic level. And it was just probably with Skibreen Rowing Club and with the great coach that Dominic is, once, once I got on, on to the the system with him, it was just a natural development. Each year you're training a little bit more and a bit more. And then probably, when did I realise? Um, probably 2000, when we got um, 
a medal at the under 23s uh, in the lightweight four. I thought, you know what, under 23s, we're, we're, we're moving up the ranks and we're getting medals now. Maybe, maybe this is something we could do. But rowing then is a terrible thing for knocking you back. And after getting that medal at the under 23s, we went on to the senior worlds and we were beaten by 15 seconds by the Danes. Now, at the time, I said to Tim, who was in my under 23 boat, I said, look, what's the point in this? We're too far off the pace. 15 seconds is, is, is a, a massive amount of time to make up. And he just said, look, you know, you got to train hard for a couple of years, put the head down and, and, and you can get up to that level with the Danes. And he was right. It did take another two years. And next thing we were in the final in 2003 at the Senior World Championships Committee against the Danes. Well, before that, though, let's go back to 2000 for a second. You mentioned about the bronze in the in the fourth World Under 23s. That same year, Eugene, you were picked as a as a sub, you could say, for the Olympics in Sydney. Like that must been a moment where you realised too. Okay, this is this is going pretty well. And even what was that experience like in Sydney for those couple of weeks? Yeah, I mean, I, 2000 was a brilliant year for me. Um, never in my wildest dreams did I expect to get called up for the to be the sub, the spare man for Sydney. Because I had watched that four um, compete, okay, slightly different lineup to 1996. Um, Ireland came fourth in the Olympics in 1996, which was a fantastic result. And I, I, I looked up to all these guys, and there I was, you know, being the spare man if anyone did get sick or injured at Sydney. I mean, at the Olympics, it was a dream holiday. Um, thankfully, nobody did get sick or injured. So I was able to experience the best of the Olympics, see all the top athletes, and kind of get a taste of what it could be like. And I suppose that was the time I thought, hang on a second, could I actually get to compete at the Olympics um, uh, properly and not be the sub? Um, so I suppose it did sow the seeds in my mind then that I could do it. Was there significance for you too, Eugene, to be the club's first Olympic roar? Um, even around Skib, like, were, were people kind of noticing oh, that that's Eugene, he went to the Olympics there in Sydney, kind of, could you see yourself that there was, that you were starting to get even noticed around town? Yeah, you would, I mean, I suppose the term that people would say is, oh, that's Eugene Coakley, he's the roar. I mean, probably a lot of people didn't delve into it any more than that, just kind of knew that he's the roar, he, he's the guy that trains every day. And um, But I, I think things have changed now in that, okay, everybody knows how successful the club is now with Paul and Gary, you know, winning the medal at the Olympics. But you got to remember back then, 20 odd years ago, rowing, okay, it was growing, but it wasn't on the on the same uh, national level as we have rowing nowadays. You know, everybody knows about rowing in Ireland these days. And we were talking before as well, Eugene, and you were telling me you found the transition from under 23 to senior quite a big step up to make. And you mentioned there about Timmy Harnady and other Skibbereen Roar and the time he finished 15, 16 seconds behind the Danes. Um, was there ever any moments then where you were kind of filled with doubt and you said, Jesus, we're not going to make up that gap, that we're not, we're not going to cut it at the very, very top level? Oh, for sure. I mean, that, that, that race, race in the Danes in 2001, where we were hammered, I mean, it's... I don't know how to put it into other sports. I mean, it's like playing a football match and losing by 10 goals or something. I mean, you, you hear the buzzer going for the Danes crossing the line and then you're thinking, how many more seconds is it before we cross the line? It, it's embarrassing in some ways. But then, look, we're, we were comparing ourselves against the best in the world. And those Danes I'm speaking about, they presented us the medals at the Under-23 World Championships uh, because it was on in Copenhagen. And I remember getting my medal from Eskild Everson. Uh, he was one of the great Danish rowers. And then it was so funny that fast forward a couple of years later that I was racing in the final against him. That, that was one of my proudest moments ever that I was racing a guy who presented me a medal only a couple of years earlier. And we mentioned Timmy Harnady there. Like I said, he's another skivering rower and he's a, he's a man you soldiered with in so many crews for so many years. Two, two questions all about Timmy. How good was he in his prime and how much of an influence was he on you? Yeah, Tim was a fantastic athlete. He's, he's about two years younger than me. Um, but he always seemed to see the bigger picture and where we were going. Um, I suppose he's one of these guys that he could have done high jump or pole vault and he would have been good at it. You know, it's quite annoying competing at him. If we were playing him football, he, he, he'd be showing off his skills. Just he, He's a natural, one of these natural sporting talents, whereas I lump myself into a more hard worker who just, It'd be a bit like a metronome in rowing you know you've got different people who bring so many different things to the boat timmy brought that flair and brought that coaching skill of 
of pulling the crew together. Whereas I would put myself in as a, as a metronome, you know, do the same stroke over and over again, a bit dependable person. But to be successful in any sport, you need a couple of different people to bring the team together. You know, you could never have four Kieran McCarthy's in, the, in, a, in a four because it's not going to work. You know, you need different people in the boat to bounce ideas off each other and bring different things, different qualities to the boat. And on about four different people in the boat, I'm going to take you to the to the Irish Lightweight Ford to win to the 2003 Worlds. Um, you've described that before, I think, is the best crew that you rode with. There was yourself, Timmy Harnady, Richard Archibald and Paul Griffin. What was so good about that crew, especially that year? Um, I think it probably just came together really well that year. Um, it's, it's the same crew that got a silver medal at the 2001 under 23s. And as I spoke about earlier, Tim said, you know, we're training hard. We did our, our two, two years of hard graft. Um, and we were probably, you know, the prime of our lives. We were mid-20s. Um, we were just committed to our projects. And we, we thought we could go on and win the Olympics in 2004 with that crew. And, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence. Uh, I mean, we were, we were certainly not arrogant. But we, had, we had a confidence that we could take on anybody in the world, um, that we were that good. Um, and it just a belief in ourselves. And it, it, it just worked. It was one of those things that just worked. And at the 2003 Worlds in Milan, that's when the Irish Lightweight Four qualified for, for the following year's Olympics in Athens. And then I think he finished sixth in the final. But heading into that winter, so you must have been pretty confident. OK, we're, we're moving in the right direction. The, 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 the board is fast. It can get faster. So looking forward to Athens in 2004, were you pretty confident that you could do something that an, an Irish crew had never done before and bring home a medal? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, like you said, it had never been done before, so we 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 planned to be the first crew. But I clearly remember being over in in Seville, where we did a lot of our winter training, and our coach at the time, the Norwegian Tor Nielsen, said uh, we were going too fast um, because we did a race in January two thousand and four. Um, it's just a kind of a, a small local race where whoever happens to be in Seville at the time takes part, and uh, we did a two minutes fifty one for a thousand meters, and we beat the Dutch by a length and a half, two lengths, over a thousand meters. It's just a massive the distance. Um, so confidence was sky high, but I actually remember in Tor saying, look, lads, you're going too fast. We've got still six months to go on Latins. But, you know, we were young, made no difference to us. We just wanted to go fast all the time. You mentioned Tor Nielsen there, like, and he's, he's a legendary figure in, in world rowing. He's the he's the master of rowing, some people call him. Like, he's a, he's a huge presence and he almost guarantees success wherever he goes. Um, what are your main memories of, of learning and, and being trained under Tor Nielsen? Yeah, Tor, like you say, you've, you know, you've covered what he is there. He, he's, he's touched the worlds of so many lives of so many people around the world. He's been in Italy in the 80s. Um, and probably he was the person that did bring the success to Ireland um, back in the early 90s when lightweight rowing was kind of our predominant sport in rowing terms. But uh, Tori, he never said much, but um, just a couple of comments, you know, you'd hang on every word he'd say. And because he had garnered so much respect from all the cl other crews he'd coached over the years, I I'd say he's the most decorated coach in the world. Um, he, he had that kind of aura of, of a bit of a fear about him, you know, that as you should, you know, as, as a top coach, you know, you know, nobody would question anything about him. And we were somewhat afraid in some respect, not just that we, we did exactly what he told us to do, you know. And his training camps were legendary. Can you fill us in on what, what they were like? Like you said, you used to go to Seville. How tough are they? How many sessions would you do a day? What would a normal kind of training day look like in Seville under Thor Nielsen? Yeah, Seville was where we did most of our training in the wintertime, which was nice because it's lovely to go rowing with just a T-shirt and shorts as opposed to back in Ireland being completely wrapped up in a, in a, in a fur coat. But um, a training session in Seville for one of the three week camps would have been normally a, a run before breakfast, um, just a half to seven, just to, to kind of wake up and, and keep your weight down a little bit. Because of course we had to weigh in at 70 kilograms. Um, come back then breakfast and we do our long session in the water and that'll be our first session done. The second session then in the mid morning, we might do some weights in the gym and then we either have a little siesta or um, go for a walk or just rest up. And then the third session would be another long distance in the water. So you've got your three sessions a day in there. Um, 
And then Tora, he had a great um, knack of springing surprises on us. You know, we, we'd be leaving camp and he might say, oh, let's let's do a test in the rowing machine. So he'd just say, yeah, let's do a two kilometre test in the rowing machine. And I remember this one. It, it was a horrible incident where we did our one test and I'd fallen off the machine, you know, exhausted and got sick. And then he came over and he said, uh, yeah, Eugene, we will do another test in 10 minutes. <laughs> so it was more a mental test to see how many of us would crack under the pressure. So we all dusted ourselves down, got back on and had to go again for another 5,000 metres, which was incredible. you you know, your body can do so much, but it's a lot of the time it's your brain is stopping you from pushing to that dark place. Um, and that's what he wanted to show us with that exercise. So what Thor was doing, so like physically you were at the top of your game, but he was showing you mentally, lads, there's actually more to come from you. Like he, he was pushing boundaries, pushing you to the edge and showing that you can still walk further. Of course, yeah. I mean, that is the difference in, in, in sport between between the medalists, I suppose, um, that everybody wants it, everybody wants to win. And you've all done the same training and you're physically in good condition. But yeah, it's who wants it most in the day? Who's going to go to that dark place? And that four that you spoke about in 2003, we had that qualities that we had belief in each other and we would we would do whatever it takes. That four didn't went to Athens, but there was a change in the boat that Tim Hernady was was replaced. And I suppose to be to, to be frank, things didn't work out as well as you would have hoped for in Athens. You finished sixth in in, in the A final. Looking back now, and we mentioned it earlier, you had that opportunity or looked like you had that opportunity to become the first Irish Rowan um, Olympic medalists. Um, do you look back with Athens with regret or as, as a missed opportunity or all these years later now, 17 years on, Eugene, what are your what are your thoughts when you think of Athens 2004? Yeah, I, I never get hooked up on like this whole business that the, the media will say, oh, you could be the first crew to ever win the medal. And, you know, of course, the papers will always say that the media, but we had the opportunity for no, for no doubt we did. Um, it's a missed opportunity, but look, there's no point in crying over spilled milk. It's done. Um, we, we can't go back, turn back the clock. But in life, you know, you, it's just, it's a fine line between having, winning something and not winning it. And it was just unfortunate the way things conspired that the opportunity was taken away from us. But uh, what, there's nothing I can do to change it. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I did probably perhaps help in paving the way and then allowed you know Gary and Paul to come along and they obviously produced the goods in 2016 but do I have any do, does it give me awake at night no it doesn't no it's in the past no did you still enjoy the Olympic experience in Athens even though things didn't work out in the, in the final but that whole being part of the kind of the greatest sports show in, in the world did, was, was it fun was it even good memories looking back at it from that perspective oh for sure I mean there's nothing better than seeing people in all different sports, you know, live and up, up in the flesh. I mean, I love my sport, everything except maybe cricket. OK, I don't. Cricket's probably the only sport I don't understand or watch. But uh, just to see all the athletes from weightlifting to judo to everything around the world, all the top athletics people just knocking around, you know, having their meals in the Olympic Village. You know, these people at the Olympics are just ordinary people. They're just good at their sport. I mean, they're not like walking around like rock stars or anything like that. They're just ordinary people getting about their business, doing their training. Um, but I, that's one of the things that I appreciate most. I mean, back in Sydney, I met Carl Lewis, the, the 100 meter sprinter. Um, and then in 2004, met some great athletes as well. I had some brilliant memories there. I was coming off Athens since I was in a four day and I was looking at the at the age profile of the lightweight four because um, Timmy was back in the boat. He was just turned 22. You were 25. Paul Griffin was 24. Richard Archibald was 26. So you were still in your prime and you're probably looking ahead to Beijing 2008. But a lot happened before that. And I'm going to go now to the 2005 Worlds in Japan where that Irish lightweight four won silver. And that... That was a significant moment for that crew and, and for, for, for you too, Eugene, because you told me before that you got back to the, the hotel room in, in Japan um, through the medal on the bed. And I, I think you said you cried more kind of the relief, the emotion, because it was something tangible and physical to show from all those years of blood, sweat and tears. That was such an important moment, the 2005 Worlds, for you. That's it, exactly. I mean, you summed it up there. It, it was it was probably the culmination of 10 years that just come out that day when I went back to the hotel room and 
you know, just realised what I've achieved to be second in the world. It was an incredible achievement. Um, having, like, I, I guess this happens in all sports, you know, you've got ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster and you got to enjoy the ups and make sure you can come out of the downs because it, it's not it's not fun, obviously, with the downs and it happens in every sport. Um, but it was, I remember going to the final and one of the Dutch guys saying to us, they weren't in the, in the final, saying, oh, well, you're obviously going to win the gold medal because you're the best crew. But unfortunately, the French just picked us on the day. Um, it, it, you asked me before, had any regrets? Um, and it's probably one regret is that I can't ever say I'm a world champion because we missed our chance that day, but we were, we were did at least come away with something tangible. That Irish lightweight four was under the the, the, the guide, guidance of Harold Yarling. He came in after Tony Nielsen um, had departed after the Athens Olympics. What was what was it like under Harold, and how different was he from Tor? It was completely different. Um, I suppose Harold came from the, the East German, you know, strict system that they had. He was a great athlete back in the seventies and eighties. Um, maybe the personalities of a, of a Ger- an East German and an Irish person didn't work uh, it got off to a bad start when we were 10 minutes late for a training session and he explained how things work you know that you have to be 10 minutes before the time he sets um, we were a good crew I suppose and maybe looking back we didn't like someone coming in in 2005 telling us what to do because as a collective four we kind of knew how to how to make our boat go fast um, it took a while I suppose to build that relationship as it does with any new coach coming in um, but he didn't last long, uh, Harold, and he was gone again. Uh, two years old, he did, yeah. And at that lightweight four, like from 2005, the silver in, at the world, 2006, I think he won the, the, the Rowan World Cup. Um, I think he would gold in, was it Lucerne Posen in the silver of Munich? So you were definitely trending upwards. You were going in the right direction. And that was halfway through the, the Olympic cycle. So were the thoughts still on, still on okay, Beijing, Beijing? Um, I know Timmy had an injury round in as well, which kind of derailed him. But was it still kind of full steam ahead for the Beijing Olympic Olympics? Oh yeah, you mentioned two thousand and six. I think that season, um, like in Rome, you don't do many races. But that season, we had effectively gone unbeaten all year. We lost the first race um, to the Germans, and that was the last race we lost until we went to the two thousand and six World Championships. And okay, we were beaten by the Chinese and the French there. But uh, the other World Cups we had done, we just turned up on the day for a regatta, won the heat, won the semi-final, won the final. It was, it was like we were untouchable at that time, like the Arsenal football team, the Invincibles. Um, and I said our confidence was super high. So yeah, mid-season, taking stock, it was all looking looking good for the medal in Beijing, definitely. What happened so between end of 06 and the Olympics in, in, um, in 08? Um. <laughs> It came down to a personality clash. Um, one of the lads, Garo Tawi, just didn't uh, didn't like being, I suppose, dictated by the coach in how he should live his life. And he had enough. Um, and we were on a training camp in Samaritz. And Garo Gags just said to me one day, here, huge, um, I'm out of here. And I was like, what do you mean you're out of here? He said, that was it. His bags were packed. And he was off. Um, he had enough of it. But, you know... Sport at the top level, it's like, it's difficult. Um, you have to set your your life aside. Um, and it, okay, we were successful on the water, but was I were we enjoying it, our sport as much as we had been? I'd say no, we weren't because it was just it was too much of a, a dictatorship from the coach. So um, that ruined, I guess, two thousand and seven. By the time we got to the Olympics in 2008, you weren't in, in the boat either, but you did try and qualify with your younger brother, Richard. You kind of, you made a last gasp kind of attempt to qualify a, a lightweight double. Fill me in on that, how, how it came about that, um, I suppose, for you stepping away from the lightweight four and then those couple of manic weeks where your, yourself and Richard decided to, to go for broke and go for gold. Yeah, I mean, that was never going to work out, me and Rich, because you just... You need time in a boat for it to work. Um, but it, all those problems started from 2006 when Gags left. And then we had a terrible year in 2007. But um, Harold left in 2008. or He left the, the lightweight crew. Uh, we got another coach in. And all was going good. 
um, Garrod guys came back and, you know, when the crew was put back together, but it was something broken. It didn't go back together as it had fitted in 2006. And you might ask, oh, well, you were all sitting in the same places. What was different? But it's just, I don't know, something had changed and we couldn't find that spark um, together in 2008. And then coming up to the World Cups and the qualifying regatta, because we hadn't we hadn't qualified for the Olympics the year previously, so we had to go to the qualifying regatta. Um, the crew wasn't going well, and I took the fall for it, and I got got the chop. And another guy came in, Cahill Moynihan came in and took my place. And the only option available to me then was to have a pop off qualifying in the doubles call with my brother Richard. But like I said. You need time to, to do that, and just we didn't have enough time. We're talking about rowing too, I suppose, for people who might be too kind of too knowledgeable on the sport. It's quite a rootless sport as well, you know. Kind of, it's like you said, like you lost your seat in the in the four to, to Cahill Vinehead. Like you just have to take that in the chin, really, and push on. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, look, people lose their jobs in, in normal life, um, which is terrible. I, okay, you could say I lost my role in the four, but. Uh, looking back, I wasn't rowing well, so you know, I was a person as a coach. I would drop myself, you know. Um, somebody had to take the fall for it. And it was me. But yeah, I, sport at the top level, you leave your emotions at the door. Um, there's no no real place for it because you know it's it's just not a a nice environment. If you want to go out and have super fun, I suppose you go for a kick around on a five aside on a Saturday morning. Um, if you want to win the Olympics. There's going to be going to be pressures on you. You mentioned there about I suppose leaving emotion to one side, but bringing emotion back into it for a second. What's it like to row with Richard? Kind of how did the two V match up in a boat? And even growing up on, on, on the water, were you very competitive? Because I presume Richard was probably trying to catch up with you because you were the fella making the headlines. You were in the star every second week. You were winning sports star awards with, with, with Timmy Harnady, and then you'd Richard just a couple of years younger, saying, "I want to catch him." Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean. Richard is four years younger than me, um, and he won't mind me saying this, but he wasn't great as a junior. He just didn't pick up the skill quick enough. He, he was a great cox, and he was coxing that junior eight that you mentioned in 1997. Richard was probably six foot one, and he was still coxing that crew. Um, he, he was so so good as a cox, but probably managed to wedge him in. But yeah, he started finding his form, and he did go to under 23s in the skull, and I don't think we'd actually rode together uh, in any international level until the end. And it was a nice way to finish up my career um, to row with him in the pair towards the 2008. Yeah, you mentioned we tried to qualify in the double, but that didn't work out. Um, but yeah, it brought back, it was kind of like going full circle, as in I started rowing to have fun and now I was back rowing my brother, having fun. Okay, we weren't as competitive as we would have liked, but um, it was nice. When you brought down the curtain so on your Ireland career, Eugene, kind of, it, it's usually with rowers, for some reason, it's kind of a quite exit stage left. I'm thinking there of, of Shane O'Driscoll and Marco Donovan, who did great stuff in, in, the, in the pair a couple of years ago, and now they've stepped away from the kind of the, the international scene. And there's that much fanfare, like you don't see anything in the media about these two fellas who are world champions. So when you, when you stepped away, was it just kind of, was it a quiet exit? Were you, were you happy just to step away when you did? Yeah, I mean... I suppose it was. I, I had probably 10 years of rowing at a high level at that stage. And I suppose physically and mentally, I was tired of it. Um, I just had enough of it. Um, but yeah, stepping away. I mean, we're not professional athletes that anybody is going to care uh, that's going to be on the news or Eugene Coakley's retiring. You know, I suppose nobody cares really about that. And we don't expect any fanfare. But you, you touch on a, on a subject there that is quite serious in that, you know, for some athletes, it's hard stepping away because, you know, you compete at a high level and then suddenly you just back in, walk in the streets as a normal person, maybe. Um, and I, I, I'm pleased to see that there is some um, support out there now in, in this latest number of years. Um, I know my friend Garo Tawi is doing it out in Australia where athletes who are retiring have you know, a support net to help them, you know, transition into other jobs and other careers and whatnot. Because it is, it can be a tough time for for some athletes, yeah, for sure. How did you find that adjustment so to life after elite international rowing? 
I'm uh, fortunate. I, I was okay, but uh, I was lucky growing up in that I had my university friends and I always kind of detached myself from rowing. When I, when I put the boat back in the rack in the evening, you know, I switched off um, and I, I, I switched back on again the next day. I know some people struggle with that to switch off all the time, but I always, in parallel to my rowing, I always had some other outlets and I'd catch up with my friends and they'd ask me how rowing's going. I'd say, yeah, it's going fine. And that would be it. You know, and then we just park it and just get on talking with somebody else. So I, I felt lucky that way when I did retire, you know, I was happy to just start a new chapter and, and just put my medals in the wall and, and leave it at that. One man who was there at Skibbereen Rowing Club before you started, was there during your career and is still, still involved now, is Dominic Casey. We've mentioned him earlier in the podcast and we've mentioned Tor Nielsen and Harold Yarling. Um, in some ways, Dominic was like Tor's protege because Dominic seemed to soak up everything that that, that, that Tor spoke about and his beliefs in rowing. Um, just chatting about Dominic for, for a second, Eugene, kind of how much of an influence was he on you and what makes this man think rowing 24-7 and he's like he's like the Jurassic bone, he just does not stop? It's phenomenal, the person he is. I mean, he had a great career as an athlete himself. Um, I don't know, do a lot of people know about that? But he was unfortunate not to go to the World Championships in 1987 and 88. Um, and he certainly had the, had the talent to do it. But what he lost out as an athlete, he certainly gained as a coach because let's not forget last year he was coach, he was voted the world coach of the year, uh, which is an incredible achievement. And you're right, he has passed on everything Tor has said, perhaps, but he's also, if he's speaking to someone, he's always gathering nuggets of information from around the world about, you know, the latest um, technique, the latest sports science. He's always kind of that step ahead. And looking back now, I can see um, sports scientists and psychologists would probably put a name to what he did. But I mean, back 20 years ago, Dominic keep us hydrated. Um, you know, he didn't say it as a sports scientist. He just said it um, as, a, as a good thing to do. Um, talking about sports psychology and talent ID, like Dominic was doing that 25 years ago. So okay, now we've got a name for it. And there's clubs out there that love saying that they're high-performance clubs. But Dominic set up a high-performance centre in Skibreen before that term was ever used, you know. And, you know, I, that annoys me, some clubs that say they're a high-performance club, but they're not. You know, Dominic just floats under the radar, does his hard work um, and gets the results. You know, there's been so many good athletes to come through. It's like a production line. And people must be thinking... How can you have so many successful athletes like coming through uh, over the years? But it's just, it, it's down to Dominic and his drive to just never, never um, stop. You talk about sports psychology. And I, what I think of Din straight away is when you were younger at Derrish Nationals, he used to bring you down to the old UCC boat shed and he used to kind of keep you away from every other every other competing club at the national. So the first time they'd see is when they're coming out of the bushes and coming out of the water to kind of further down the course. Like that was all part of his thinking too, just to keep you focused on rowing. You were there to row in the nationals, keep you away from distractions from, from girls up, up from girls up in the up in the other clubs and just keep focused. You, you're here to row lads. Exactly. I mean, but I, I said Dominic was a sports psychologist, but that is exactly what a psychologist, a sports psychologist will tell any athlete at whatever level. They'll say, look, focus on the on the job in hand and then go have fun. But that, that I suppose, set us apart. Those small little bits of like staying hydrated. You know, he went and bought us hats to keep the sun off our head. All those little bits. You know, Bradley Wiggins um, had the, or Sky had the 1%, finding those 1% marginal gains. The Skibbereen Rowing Club from Dominic is always finding those gains. Um, and I suppose the results stand for themselves, don't they? And one of the biggest results in Irish rowing history, or probably the biggest result, came in 2016 when two Skib young fellas who used to chase you down the Island River um, when you were in your prime, Gary and Paul O'Donovan won silver in the Irish, uh, lightweight, men's, um, Irish lightweight, lightweight men's double at those Olympics. That was a watershed moment for the sport. Um, what were you thinking when you saw the two boys come home with silver? I think it was an incredible performance. I mean, I I, I remember going back 15 years ago, um, we'd have a race down in Skibreen from the end of the river, as we call it, right up into town. 
and the, the younger guys had set off first, you know, the Garys and Pauls and um, Mark and everyone else. And you'd have to kind of fight your way through the, the, the crowd of, of young 14, 15 year olds till you get to the front. And to see this, those guys that I had fought my way to get past, to see them now winning a silver in the Olympics was just, you know, I, I, I nearly, I did cry, I'd say, just with emotion that somebody had done it. Okay, we had missed our chance and you could say the four from 1996 had missed their chance. But finally, somebody had broken through and said, you know what? Two people from Skip Rain Rowing Club can actually be good enough to get a medal at the Olympics. And now, like, we're heading to another Olympic year, 2021, hopefully Tokyo and all that goes ahead. And you talk about that conveyor belt since um, Gary and Paul, Mark O'Donovan, Shane O'Driscoll, Finton and Jake McCarthy are there now. Look at the women's side, Aoife Casey, Emily, Emily Hegarty, Lydia Heafey. Um, the club is still producing. Like, what is the secret so Eugene, to Skibreen Rowing Club? Why is it producing year after year after year? I mean, I suppose it's a question, like any sports journalist will ask, what is the secret? There is no secret. It's just probably the one man with the drive to keep the club going. And then the club has got to such a level now, there's people coming in and they say, you know what, I've seen what Paul and Gary or Denise Walsh have done. You know, I want to emulate them. And if they've done it, well, why can't I do it? And Tor Nielsen had a great saying before. He said, the year of the Olympics, nobody comes down from space. Um, to take part in the, in the Olympic Games. They, everybody has two arms and two legs. So why not take these people on? And one of Dominic's great things when he'd push you off from the dock would say, look, um, you're going out for the World Championships or whatever else, he'd say, you've got to take these people on. And that's that's exactly what Skibreen does. They just take people on. They train hard, of course, um, and they've got the right support, right coaches. They've got a perfect environment, probably the best river in the world. Um, that's another plus for the town, for the Royal Club. So once you add up all those pluses that we have, it makes up success. And they've been taking on the best in the world for, for countless years and will c- continue to do so in the future. Eugene, thank you so much for coming on the podcast this weekend and looking back and sharing some of your great memories. Delighted, Kieran. Thank you for having me on. Access Credit Union has always been at the heart of our community through good and bad times. We want to continue to play our part in helping our community through the COVID-19 crisis. As businesses reopen, we encourage our community to work together by staying local, borrowing locally and spending locally. Access Credit Union is here to help. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And before we wrap up, we're just going to quickly preview Thursday's Southern Star Sports section. Kieran, you mentioned there's a four-page special marking the 50th anniversary of the Skibbereen Rowing Club. So that's one to look out for for sports fans from anywhere in West Cork or around the country. But what else can readers expect this week? Yeah, just to mention, Jack, in that four-page special, there's a deep dive into Affidown, the parish of rowers. Um, it's this parish outside Skibbereen that has produced so many top-class rowers over the years. So I'm taking a closer look at some of the roars it's produced and why it has produced the roars that it has. So that's well worth it. And also, I have a great interview with Grania O'Donovan, one of the original female stars of Skibbereen Rowan back in the early 1990s, where she was absolutely phenomenal. In the space of three or four years, she won 10 Irish Rowan Championship titles. By the time she got to 19, she was already burned out. So it's well worth the read of Grania O'Donovan's story, and that's in Thursday's Southern Star continue going on besides that um you mentioned martin walsh last week with his, his motorsport columns and he's another cracking one this week it's with john hodness um well known in auctioneering circles now but who was also involved in in um in motorsport for a spell so martin tells his story um joe mccarthy's caught up with uh, west cork and Muskie gda james mccarthy to talk more about last week's front page story about but why we need to get kids back in pitches, how kids are being forgotten in this current pandemic, how it's affected them. So good stuff from Joe McCarthy there with James McCarthy. That's well, that's well worth reading. Also, we tell the story of the Castle Towns and Bowler, Maureen O'Driscoll, who is doing great things and has done great things. She's two All Ireland's to her name already. Also, the Irish Athletics, um, our West Cork Irish athletes, should I say, Phil Healy, Joan Healy, Dara McIntyre, we're all picked for the Ireland team to go to the European indoors next week. They all had a super outing at 
this event last weekend. And just for listeners of this podcast, make sure to check out our other podcast this week, which is an athletic special and includes an interview on Phil Healy. Um, so that was out on Monday. So that's well worth checking out as well. So know what's going on in, in this week's Southern Star Sports section, Jack. And just to finish as well, the calls for Gavin Crooms to get his, I suppose, his big chance with Ireland are growing. In the last couple of days, both Stephen Fer- Ferris and Bernard Jackman have said, put Gavin in. Um, so it's interesting to see what will happen over the next couple of weeks with Gavin Crooms. He's flying at Munster. He got his eighth try of the season last weekend when Munster beat Edinburgh in the Pro 14. So we've that story and more in terms of Southern Star. Great stuff. And as Kieran said, that will be in shops across West Cork and beyond from Thursday morning. But if you can't make it to the shops, you can always subscribe online. Just go to www.southernstar.ie and you can read to Southern Star on your computer, tablet or smartphone for less than two euro per week. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport podcast. We'll be back at the same time next week. If you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Slán Tommel.